So my name is Dan Walker, and I'm a woodworker. Uh, I, I own and operate the company known as Foundwoods. It's not even really a company. It's just kind of a one-man one operation, and with my wife helping me out a lot, too. I have to give her credit. Um, what were the other questions you had? Well, we'll, we'll get oh, okay. to Okay. So basically what I do is I don't really specialize. I do... Um, I don't know how to describe what I do, really. It's anything that a person might need made out of wood. There's plenty of things I haven't done yet that I want to, but honestly, I mean, I'm interested in all of it. So if somebody was to come up to me and say, hey, man, you know, it's looking like rain and I'd like a really big, big boat to put two of every kind of animal on, I would be interested in making that. <laughs> honestly, I'm just as happy making coasters and birdhouses or whatnot. Honestly, I just, I just enjoy working with that medium. So what got you into making working with wood and making these sort of things? Oh, gosh. It started probably almost 40 years ago when I was in junior high. I started doing it. I did a few pieces, and I really enjoyed it. And then I got, you know, life got in the way, and I just got away from it. And, um, oh, man, I don't know, like – 2010 or 11, I guess, a friend of mine was making log furniture and I came into his shop while he was working on a piece and he's like, here, you want to try this? So he put this draw knife in my hand, which is what you use for scraping the bark off of logs and shaping them. And I started doing this and I'm like, man, this, I don't know, something clicked. I was like, I really like this. So I started doing it. And next thing you know, I started making a few pieces and fiddling around with logs. And I didn't think much of it. And then, uh, I, uh, I guess it was 2015, 14 and 15 when the, I was working in the oil field and the oil field crashed. So I was not working at the time, waiting, just waiting for my, the company I worked for. They hadn't laid me off, but I had no rigs to go to. So I was home for a lot and I started casting around for something to do. And that, that just came, I said, hmm, I wonder, I'll try some woodworking. And the more I did, the more I liked it. I started out with simple stuff, which was, was horrible. I, just, I made horrible stuff. I mean, stuff like, you know, if it was a woodshop project in junior high, I made a lot of C minuses <laughs> with them being generous. But, but, an example of one of those pieces that you made. Um, let me think. I made some really bad signs, like super, super bad. I used the, um, they sell them at Menards. They have like this template kit where you, you uh, lay the, the letters down and you, you trace the letters and then you try to carve them out by hand with a router. Yeah, it was pretty bad. But I started getting better and then we started just doing these little sales. We would go to, they, their events would be um, advertised around Casper like we did one at the VFW and then a few other places. And it's like anything else, especially the fact that I enjoyed it so much that I put my time in, I made a lot of mistakes. I learned, you know, the nice thing, like I tell all my customers is if you don't like what I make, it's a dry piece of wood covered in a flammable liquid. It will at least provide you some warmth. It will burn nicely. <laughs> so, so One way to you know, look like, at yeah. <laughs> and it, the cool thing is it, it's kind of a running joke among, among woodwork, woodworkers. It's not that I'm getting better. It's that I'm getting better at hiding my mistakes. So, you just you gradually you develop a style you, you you do the things you like and that that's one thing i'm i'm lucky with is i was still as i was still growing and learning in in the craft and it, you still do it it's, it never stops but i mean when i was just developing my basic skill set and my styles um i had another source of income so i wasn't beholden to making people telling me what to make i could make what i want and then i think Doing that helped my skills develop faster because I wasn't I wasn't like someone like a lot of people will say you're making like cornhole boards because you go, wow, people will buy those and you make 50 of them. Well, that's great. You get good at making cornhole boards, but you don't get good at anything else. So I would see something or someone would suggest a project to me and go, wow, that's really neat. You, you should try that. And I'll go, you know what? You're right. I should. Let me try it. And, and that's how you progress. What's the hardest thing you've ever experimented to try and make? Jewelry boxes, they're really hard because, um, like I make the, I think you probably saw it. I make the little jewelry box. It almost looks like a jukebox and it has pull out drawers and it's made from a bunch of pieces. So all the pieces have to fit properly 
And any mistakes, it's actually easier to make big stuff than it is to make small stuff because the small stuff, the, the mistakes, any any misalignment or misfitment or anything like that, any little little error you might make in it, it just jumps out at you because the, the canvas is so small. What you're looking at is so small that the big stuff, I can hide all sorts of mistakes. Yeah, I can hide all sorts of mistakes in big stuff. <laughs> okay. So so you don't like jewelry boxes. You try, uh, uh, like you I said- actually, you I do like them. They're just a challenge. They're, they're hard to make. So you said the bigger stuff is easier to make. So like like uh, cabinets or going bigger than that. Um, the biggest thing I have made to date is I made a really big uh, live edge floating entertainment center for a guy, and that was really cool. That was a lot of a lot of big work, a lot of big cuts, but it turned out beautiful. I made it last year, and a friend of mine had actually come over and helped me because the wood was so heavy that when we were putting it together and making the cuts, but it was really cool. It turned out really nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, how long does your average piece take you to make? A week. Just a week? It, it, and it depends on what I make. I can make, like, I can make a little garden sign in three days. That's with the, the drying time for the finishes, or it can take me a month to build a bow. It, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of it is you're dependent on drying times for finishes because you can't, especially when you're doing um, like real high uh, shine finishes, you have to have it cure fully because, and then you want to, so you spray a layer down, like I do a lot of spray finishes, you'll spray, spray a layer down. That has to be dried completely because then you take a real fine buffing pad and what you're doing is you're knocking down the high spots because it never goes on evenly. That's what you hear painters talk about orange peel. You'll, you'll wind up with a texture, whether you like it or not, because it goes on unevenly. So then you knock down the high spots and then you spray another layer and you keep doing that. And what you're really doing is you're filling in the low spots. You're knocking the high spots down and then you're filling in the low spots. It's never going to be, you know, it's not, it's not like it's going to line up perfectly. One time the low spots will be over here and then they're here, you know, it's scattered randomly. So the idea is to keep adding layers to fill that in. That's how car painters do it too. You're, you're leveling off that glossy finish and then but you have to wait for it to fully cure because if it's soft it will just gum up and smear yeah. so that's what takes a lot of the time but uh, it's also one of the one of the core philosophies that i do is i could make the high-end stuff like i go to jackson i go to scottsdale i go to these high-end places where they sell very expensive woodworking and the thing that sticks in my craw is it's, I love woodworking. Everybody loves, for the most part, somebody will have some some piece of wood made item that they like. It may not be furniture or whatever, but it's patently unfair that only wealthy people can have it in their house. So I don't make that high end stuff for that reason. I try to keep my prices low enough so that the average person, I mean, who has the money right now, especially to spend $3,000 on a table or $10,000, it's not unheard of at all. I can take you to places and show you these things. I don't want to cater to those people because they are so they're also so brutally unforgiving. You know, you think about if you're going to shell out that kind of cash, you expect absolute perfection and you will also be making it the way they want it. There will be very little negotiation on this, you know, because of the, the amounts of money that are involved. Whereas I can make something that looks nice that people really like and they actually look at the irregularities in it as character. They, 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 it's very rare for me to have somebody point out something on something I make and go, I don't like that. Yeah. Because I, I, I understand my market and I'm catering to them. The difference so, in that sense, they're look, like you said, they're looking at it like character. It's that extra unique part of it instead of, you know, that's a mistake. I want it done, done again. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Someone that just just paid you fifteen thousand dollars to make them a twelve foot long walnut table doesn't want to hear about the problem you had with the finish at the back corner of that table. They just want it fixed. Yeah. And that I do this because I enjoy it. I don't like putting that kind of pressure on myself. I do take it, it's miserable, man. I'll tell you what I I suffer for my art and and I love it at the same time, but. When I'm doing stuff that has deep meaning to people, like memorials and stuff like that, I mean, I worry myself sick, I obsess, and I, I'm sure everybody does, if anybody that really cares about what they do. And so 
I like doing those, but I try not to do too many because of that, because it, it will kill your love for it. And one of the really, and the other thing that I do that the great, some great advice I got from a custom gunsmith I worked for, for a while I worked with, he was teaching me only work on it when you want to, that if you start forcing yourself, you'll never do your best work. You'll start cutting corners just to get it done. And if you don't enjoy the process, you're doing the wrong thing. So, I mean, if you're, I mean, there's stuff that every woodworker hates. Nobody likes to sand, to sit there and just mindlessly, as you're going down through the grits of sandpaper, just back and forth, back and forth, even with a power sander. I mean, you're just like, okay, I am ready for this to be over. But at the same time, you've got to want to do it. You have to understand that this is part of the process. And you go, okay, I don't like this, but when I get this done, I'm going to get to do the great part, which is that first coat of finish. Or when you when you knock the you lift the grain with where you do an alcohol rub and you can see what it's going to look like and you're like yes this is exactly you know when it when it even surprises you when you're expecting it to look good but then it looks even better and you're like yes this that's the part that you live for but if you're sitting there and just like I couldn't imagine these guys that sit and knock out hundreds of pieces at a time you know like a production run or like like an assembly line you know what I mean it's just there, you can do it. You can make money at it, but why not just go get a regular job then? You know, that's one thing that I've noticed with all of the creative people that I've been working with here is everybody has this this thing in every group that they they don't want to do, right? Like you were talking about the sanding and and stuff like that. You have to do it to make it look good. Uh, for writers, it tends to be like editing. They hate the editing Proof. process. And editing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the drudgery. It's the drudgery, but you also understand. But you can tell yourself, you know, like for me, Ed, that I know that the the better I do this, even though I don't like doing it, it's going to pay a dividend down the road. I'm going to like it. You know, it's going to make it look better or whatever. Yeah, if that and makes then, sense. Yeah, and for you, the the devils in the details, like you were saying, you know, you make those little mistakes and stuff like that. You think that's horrible. Oh my gosh, I totally messed this piece up. But then the person who you sell that to goes, that is unique. There isn't another one like that in the world. That's got to give you some sort of sense of accomplishment. Yeah, it does. And the, the same thing is the thing I had to learn to do was shut up. Like I would be delivering a piece, a custom piece to a customer. And I would sit there and literally talk trash on myself. I would show them all the stuff that was wrong on it. And I, you know, listening to very experienced woodworkers, they're like, shut up. First, 99, 99 people out of 100 would have never noticed that. And second, yes, they probably like it. They, they will tell you, and that's the big thing, is stop telling people what it should look like. If they like how it looks, then, that, then you made it right. It doesn't matter what you think. If I think, you know, and it's funny because I go, my, my best friend, him and his wife, I laugh. They're like my gallery. They have so much of my work and a ton of it. And it's neat because you can see the skill progression, but man, them early pieces are hard to look at. <laughs> and then I just cringe and they love them. They love them. And they're not, they're not just do, they're not just saying that because to, to hurt my feelings. I mean, I've heard other people, you know, hear, I've heard from other people about them complimenting my work to them saying, yes, we love this piece. You know, this coffee table is great. We love it. And I just look at it and go, oh God, I want to fix it please let me fix it. And she's like, Nope, it's not going anywhere. It's right here. It is what it is. Yeah. And that, that's interesting because like, like I was saying with, with other people I've worked with of, of any creative nature, there's always that, that thing that bugs them about their, their work or their, their, uh, uh, whatever it was that they did. There's something that bugs them that they just can't unsee. They can't get away from it. But I've also learned that that's the most, that ends up being the thing that people notice the most and they love the most usually because it makes it more unique. It makes it more maybe human depending on what the project was as opposed to, oh my gosh, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect in every way. Like, and I think, I think that's the, that's the difference in Eastern and Western philosophies of craftsmanship. Like there are schools of thought where, you know, Especially, that's why I don't do traditional cabinet making, because it's militant. You must absolutely make a joint this way. It must be absolutely perfect. 
everything must, must, must. It's tyrannical that it absolutely has to be done this way. And if not, my God, they'll come after you with torches and pitchforks. But you have other philosophies, like you said, that embrace this stuff. They, they, they embrace and incorporate the mistakes. And you can't even call them mistakes now. They're accents or features. And when you treat them like that, it's, it, it's really cool. I like to say, especially when I'm working with live edge pieces, it's a negotiation. I know what it wants to be. It has its say in the matter too, <laughs> as to what it's going to look like. And we meet in the middle. I try to I try to coax as much functionality out of something without making. I mean, you can take the most beautiful piece of wood, run it through machines, and make it look just like a board you bought from Home Depot. I yeah. can take every bit of character out of it. I can I can make it absolutely flat, flush, square, plumb, everything. And you know what you got? A generic piece of wood, where if you you know, you start uh, building with it and then you go, OK, well, this isn't going to be perfectly square and I'm going to have to make this, this a little different. You accommodate what it is and you try to make what it is into what you want it to be while still not changing what it is. And that's a real challenge. It's very interesting. It's a lot of fun, but it's hard to do when um, the big thing is trying to make it work in a place that's completely um different than what it is like you go to somebody's house and they want you to do a live edge shelf for them and you're like man your wall ain't straight <laughs> you know your wall's not straight and it's it's gonna look goofy in here i'm gonna do what you want don't get me wrong i mean the customer is always right in matters of taste but at the end of the day you're just you're walking away cringing just going okay well i'm glad you like it i hope i never see that again and i hope you're happy with it forever but i never want to see that again and I'm sure it's the same, you know, you talk to recording art, recording artists and stuff like that. I'm sure they say the same thing that, you know, hey, I, I produce this thing. I don't really like it. But if you like it, then I then I'm happy. We yeah. don't all like the same things. There there was a band out there. I, I Forgive me. I don't remember what band it was, but one of their greatest hits ever. The best song that ever hit number one for them and all that. They absolutely hated the song. And I don't that was Warrant. It was, it was the band Warrant with the song Cherry Pie. <laughs> the whole it was the album title too. They hated it. They absolutely hated it. I saw it on a rockumentary. They were talking about it. Yeah, they were like, "This is the dumbest, most horrible, stupid song." And the the label made them do it. Yeah. And they hated it. And then and now, can you imagine having to stand up there every night when you're on tour and play a song you hate? Well, because they're gonna they're gonna That's say soul crushing. You're, it, you go and you sell these things and then somebody hears about it and they're like, hey, I want that. And you're like, oh, no, not another one of those. I don't want to do another one of those. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. You know? Like you said, the, the customer wins out in that, but you're, you're like, I don't want to see that again. Please stop asking for that. <laughs> No, you're just you're just like, well, this this is punishment for something wrong I did in a previous life or something. That think about that, how horrible that would be. Imagine you're like a musician and you you whatever, like in a drunken stupor or whatever, you write some dumb jingle. Yeah. Or, you know, it's gotta be the same way with like a comedian. How many hundreds of times do you have to perform the same bit? Like you think oh, of your God. favorite bit from whatever comedian and think about that guy. What's he thinking inside? You know, he can he can re he's probably detached from the whole experience by now because he's told the joke so many times and he set it up and all that. And now he's just like blah blah blah. I wonder if they if they like daydream, like the really yeah. good stand up comedians or whatever. If they're like standing up there and they're already thinking about what they're going to have for dinner after the show or whatnot, and it's just their mouth running that's that's saying the words. But it's like when you when you sing a song that you saying a hundred times you know the words yeah. by heart and you're not you don't even have to think about it they just come out but how yeah. how draining that has to be but right. that's why i could never that's why i don't I, I i try to break it up there are certain things like um i made a bunch of jack-o-lanterns last year for halloween i think you remember that i made all of those dude i was yeah. cranking those things out and you you said the thing is what i worry about too is you know what i do is dangerous you have got to be focused. You cannot daydream while you're feeding a circular or a table saw. That's how you wind up staring at a pile of your own fingers. That, um, yeah, exactly. Still got all ten of them. There's some scars and some dings, but they're still all attached. 
Frodo but, and the are going on here. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. And that's that's the thing. Again, that's discipline. And I, I do that sometimes. It's hard when you start – you get up against deadlines. That's the business side of it that you, you battle, that you get up against deadlines and you say, okay, I've got to have – you know, I've got a market coming up. I've got to have product to display and I've got to have X number. And now, you know, you, you, a lot of times what I do is I cast about for a product because, you know, how many people where we live, I think, you know, my stuff is all over town now and it's, it's really cool to see your stuff, but the market can saturate quickly here with an item when something's popular. So I'm always looking for the next thing, the next thing I'm, the next thing I'm going to make that everyone's going to want. But at the same time, I've got to keep making those things that people have been wanting because they invariably come up to you at the market and say, hey, I bought such and such sign from you two months ago. My sister saw it and I really want to get her one. Well, if you don't have one because you got sick of making it or you thought nobody else wanted it, guess what? You just lost a sale. So you have to keep that stuff. You have to keep making that stuff. So it does. It gets repetitive. Yeah. And so you got it, but I, that's where I have to tell myself, even though you know that this needs to get done, I'm not in the condition to do this today. Today, I don't do this. Yeah. I don't touch the saw today. If you're sick, if you're tired, yeah. It's like anything else. Like we've talked about trying to force yourself to be creative. You'll never do your best work that way. You, I don't even think you'll do good work that way. But you, you know, and you know, you do the same thing. You get up late and, and, and write. I've been in the shop two or three o'clock in the morning. You can just get in a groove and you start making stuff and time becomes meaningless. Oh yeah. That everything, you know, everything works. But I, I have the other days too, where I just go, okay, the universe says I'm not making anything out of wood today. I'll clean my shop. I'll do something productive, but today it ain't happening. And those can be sometimes the worst days because like, particularly when you are running against those deadlines, you're like, I really need to get that done. But, it's just not happening today. It's just not. But the thing is, though, you you learn that you know the big thing for me is since my stuff is so nature based, the best thing I can do, and I feel, and it's bad because I'm I'm a person that's that's driven by a lot of things, is going out and just taking a day off, go walk in the woods, go sit somewhere pretty, whatever, and it recharges my batteries. And man, I can't tell you the number of times I have come back. And just some great work because of it. But being able to do that, I think more people need to be able to do that. That you need to find whatever your muse is, whatever, whatever flow, whatever well your creativity flows from. You gotta dip into that and recharge. Because I think a lot of people are so driven. <laughs> is that you? Uh, I said provided that, that well or that inspiration is legal. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not talking about drugs. I'm, we all we all draw inspiration from things. Every creative person does. I don't think drugs really help anybody. You you get creativity when it strikes. You get that that whatever. And going out and doing things, you you get that creativity. Some of the, some of the best work I personally have ever written has been from when I was in a war zone. And that's that's a completely that's a story for another time. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. No, but yeah, that that I know what you're saying though, that you can get yourself into that creative mindset and mm -hmm. you know what it feels like when you get there, when things are really working. You know, when I'm doing design work or whatever, and I'm like, Oh man, this is gonna be good. You can tell, you know, or when I'm working on something and I'm like, Oh, this is gonna be good. Okay, I'm on to something here, let's keep going. And but it's frustrating as hell learning and it's taken me seven years now learning when is the time and to recognize the circumstances and go, oh no, this is too good to stop. Or, all right, I'm getting nowhere here. The universe has decided I'm done. Yeah. I, I'm done for the day. Let's pick it up tomorrow and see what happens. See where we go from there. Yeah. So what piece took you the longest to ever make? Hmm. Oh, actually, let's see if I can show it to you. Hold on, field trips. <laughs> is that a bag? It's a coffee table. Oh. You know why it took me the longest to make? Because I screwed it up three different times. 
I didn't. It has an epoxy finish on it. It was one of the very first epoxy tables I ever did. That um, that coffee table is the slab itself is four inches thick, and it's from a probably two hundred year old lodgepole pine in the Bighorn Mountains. Actually, I bought it. I didn't go get it. I bought it from a guy here in Casper, and I let it dry for years to finish drying. But well, the first time I did the epoxy. I didn't follow the instructions. Go figure. And so the epoxy never hardened. It was like goo. It was like imagine, imagine like um, like yeah, like bubble gum. Like imagine yes. six, sixty pounds of bubble gum is what I had. Uh, no. So I had I waited weeks for this to dry and harden, and it never did. And so I wound up having to use scrapers and. I don't know how much sandpaper I went through because it would immediately, because I mean, you can't sand gum. <laughs> it, would, it would just fill the sandpaper up. So this, this table, once I got it all back down to bare wood, it actually did the epoxy the way I was supposed to. I think I had probably three or four months in this table, but oh, wow. yeah, that, that was, that took me the longest. But, huh. and I keep it, it, I see all the things that are wrong with it. And it's, it's just one of the pieces, one of the things I do is I try to keep as many of the pieces I screw up as I can. I actually have the, the, the walls of my shop are decorated with mistakes. So because it keeps me humble. It uh, keeps me humble. It reminds, it reminds me that no matter what, cause I mean, it's easy to start really getting pretentious and get a head full of ideas when I can go to the farmer's market and people will just rave. Oh my gosh. I love your stuff. It's so great. It's so beautiful. I love it. You're so talented. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. All yeah. of a sudden I'm the greatest thing in the world. Well, now I go back to my shop and I look at those six wooden flags that are screwed up and I look at the table with the crack in it and I look at the, the stuff that I screw up and I go, yeah, you're great, buddy. You're, yeah, you sure are. Just keep thinking that. And, yeah. and I think it's an important part of the work because I think your work has a lot of your personality in it. And if you're a jerk, man, your stuff's going to be crappy. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy. And, and, I mean, don't get me wrong. It is it is the greatest drug ever. I'm totally addicted to it. Seeing how pap happy my stuff makes people is is just. I, th I told you the story about the wishing well, right? So, um, this lady contacted me, and her father had made this wooden wishing well years and years ago, and it had been left, you know, out in the elements. He died. And sometime after he died, it really started falling apart. It was all rotten and the paint was coming off of it and stuff. So um, her mother had said about how she really wished they could get it fixed and it, it looked terrible and stuff. Well, as, as a surprise, they had me come over while her because her mother lived with them. While her mother was gone, they had me come pick it up and rebuild it. Well, the whole time I was rebuilding this, her husband was taking heat from his mother-in-law because they had told her mother that they threw it away oh, so she no. was furious she was furious at him right yeah. and so i really I, I mean so i i poured a lot of myself into this because i knew it was going to be a really cool project and i used as much of the original stuff as i could and i got it all done you know well it was like a tv show it was like the big reveal, right? So we go and bring this up. And um, when she saw it and started crying, man, it just blew me away. I was like, yep, that, that, it's stuff like that that sets the hook and that keeps yeah. me going. What's that? You also said those are the pieces you hate the most because you put so yeah. much effort and time into it and you're trying to make it right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's what you want to do. And the pressure is absolutely crushing. Probably the hardest piece I have ever made was a gravestone for a little boy that had died, an infant. We made a wooden, uh, uh, what had happened is his mother got on Facebook and thieves had stolen his headstone out of the graveyard. Oh, they actually, yeah, it was a, you know how like the, the headstones lay flat? It was one of those kind, I don't know what the name of that is, where it lays flat against the ground. Yeah. So um, they had stolen that because it wasn't, I guess it was just kind of like it had a few spikes holding it into the ground and some yeah. horrible people pried it up out of the ground and, and stole it. And this was a young mother, probably in her early 20s, and the, the baby had died as an infant. I wasn't sure how, how long he, he had lived or anything like that. 
So she was just beside herself. So collectively, a bunch of people got some money together and paid me to do this. And I, and I really all I needed, I, at the time I was so broke, I couldn't, I, I donated all my labor, but they had, they helped with the, the cost of the materials. And so we built this thing and made it in such a way that it couldn't be stolen. And it was just me and her in this cemetery while it was raining. And when I got this thing, I finally got it in place and got it set down. And uh, she asked me if, if she could hug me. And we just both stood there in the rain crying. And I was like, man, this is what I'm supposed to do. This, this, this is, you know, again, it was another one of those moments where it just, it sets the hook. And you're like, yep, this, this, for all the, the days when I'm in the shop throwing tape measures and cussing and, you know, bleeding because I've got splinters under my fingernails, this, this makes it all worth it, you know, and you, you see, you see stuff like that. I mean, nothing I do is going to change the world. I get that. But when I see people super happy with stuff that I made them, you know, I make a silly little sign. I make these, like one of the most popular things we make are these little personalized garden signs. But when they, a little kid gives it to their grandma or, you know, um, somebody gives it to their wife or something like that. And it has meaning. And I love reading, like on my Etsy store, I get the reviews. And I love reading those when I start feeling bad. And I just feel like, you know, everybody doubt creeps into everyone's life. And to me, it, you start, you're like, you know, man, I suck. My work sucks. This isn't any good. People have finally figured out, figured it out. I'm a fraud. You know, I don't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and. I, I go back and then read that stuff. That's where it's comforting where you're like, okay, I'm just, just calm down. Don't, don't go down that road. There was a, um, I read a thing not too long ago where it said, um, most writers sat in front of a tape in front of a typewriter for four or five years, just telling themselves, I'm a fraud. No one will ever buy anything I write. So that's why their books cost money and why you should pay them for them because they deserve compensation. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. That, that whenever you're doing, and the, the hardest part is, to, I, I remember how weird it felt, it felt the first time I told somebody I was a woodworker. And the first time I heard someone call me an artist, it's like hearing someone call you by a different name. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think of myself that way. I'm just a knucklehead with some saws and sandpaper. But, hey, people like what I make. Well, and that's that's why I wanted to feature you specifically in that you were actually in the first issue of the fable is because I see it as art. I've seen a lot of the stuff that you've done and a lot of that, it takes skill, it takes talent and it takes things that people don't even realize like hearing those stories the dedication and the time spent on that and the the want to make it perfect is exactly what any artist any creative of any type knows all too well they're like oh no it's not going to be perfect it's not going to be what i want it to be but then they go and they they put it out there they put it to the world and suddenly people are like no it, it wasn't perfect but it was so you, it was the way it should be sort of thing, you know? And that's, that's yeah. really hard for any creative type to deal with. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, because anything you make like that is it's a piece of you and it, it's a statement, you know, anything I make is a statement of my skills that yeah. did I make this good enough? Is it, you know, did I, how, how much care did I take? How much precision is there? Whatever it is. You know, it's the same way with a singer or a painter or or an author. It's the same thing that you, especially like I worked a lot with musicians when I was younger, that especially a singer, you are, I can't imagine anything more vulnerable than that, except maybe an actor where you are the product. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that, that sound that comes out of your mouth as a singer, that's it, man. And you are totally being judged by that. And oh, you, yeah. you are ultimate, you are utterly and totally vulnerable mm -hmm. that, that to actually, um, come out and do that is got to be so incredibly difficult for them. Like I said, for me, it's just wood, you know, I, I get, yeah, it's pretty and all, and I make stuff out of it, but at the end of the day, it's still, it's a standard skill set that's just being applied in a creative way. 
where with them, man, it is, you know, we had talked about that before, like the, that I consider the ultimate form of writing to be the short story because mm-hmm. it is the most difficult to do well. Oh, you can, you can hack stuff together and make something that, that's good enough, but to really do it like, well, like the people that, that are known for their short stories, it's an amazing skill set. It would be like you, you know, like, like, well, like they do in the, in the TV shows, like Forged in Fire and stuff like that, where they put them on a time limit. They're like, yeah, I'm sure you can make something beautiful in six months. What can you do in six hours? Yeah. Put, put short- you up against it. Yeah. Well, and like you're saying with your woodwork, if somebody doesn't like one, one or two of your pieces, you're like, oh, OK, I just didn't I just didn't put the right pieces together at this point. Whereas like you're saying with an actor or singer somebody doesn't like that it's not doesn't like your style or doesn't like your tone or just doesn't like you for whatever reason that's that's literally a rejection of you and not like hey yeah. you know all that work you spent in the shop i just didn't like that piece it's it's a rejection of you don't look good you're not the right part or you're you're yeah. you're not doing the notes we want you to <laughs> yeah and that's that's the luxury i have in the medium that i that i work in that my stuff's just laying there. If you don't like it, you'll just walk by. Yeah. You're not rejecting me. You just, like yeah. you said, people, I accept that people have different tastes. They go, okay, well, you know, I don't want a poop sign in my $600,000 house. Okay, I get it. <laughs> you know? Yes. May I interest is- you in some of these higher end items over here? Isn't that one of your Etsy best sellers, though, that poop sign? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. And it, they, cha- they changed from year to year. But yeah, and that's, that, that's what I was talking about that you and it's funny I've given up trying to predict like I, I the number of times I've gone you know where I I look at something and go oh man that's going to be hot that's going to be hot and it's just crickets nobody it, I might as well just put a pile of sawdust out on the table nobody's even looking at it and then it's something that I just I made on a whim that's that's why I never discount anything that I have people send me stuff all the time and i don't just go nah nobody's gonna want that because i've been proven wrong too many times my, my wife is my biggest champion of this because she goes to 99 percent of the events with me and i'll just be like i don't think i'm gonna make any of those or i'll be like or i start talking about cutting prices because something isn't selling and it has happened far too many times for it to be chance she's just like no the right person hasn't looked at it and i and I think that's for any art that ultimately that was something I learned in an art class that I took that I, really stuck with me is you don't have to justify your art. I made this. OK, I don't have to tell you why it's good. I don't have to tell you, you know, why you should buy this or why you should think it's good. It just is. Art is art. Now, what you want to do with it, how you want to grade it is your business. But there's someone there, you know, you, you look at some of the stuff. I, I don't understand it. I don't claim to understand modern art. I don't know why Andy Warhol's paintings go for millions of dollars, but people are willing to pay that. So who am I to judge that the ultimately? Right yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the hard part is you, you automatically assume that if I was any good, everyone would love me. It's not true. Look, name, name any band that's multi-platinum and I can find you a hundred people that hate them without oh, even yeah. working very hard. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing that, that you have all these fabulous artists, artists whose talent is obvious, but you know, they're not your style. You, you don't care for it. So that was, that was a real hard thing for me for a, for a long time. And it, it, it instilled a lot of self doubt. Maybe I'm not good enough. You know, maybe, maybe this, Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe there are people that are better and I'm not, you know, I can't compete with them. And w- once you start doing that, I don't think that's healthy at all. And it sure as heck isn't going to take you. You're not going to grow. If anything, you're going to turn on yourself and it, it clouds everything you do after that. I think the, a big obstacle for a lot of people is they don't understand that you're always going to suck at something when you start when you start new i mean it's such so unrealistic to go you know what i'm just going to go buy a typewriter tomorrow and i'm or a word processing program and i'm going to write the best book ever if i have any talent no it is a craft art any type of art you are going to study it you are going to develop and hone your skills i mean 
just go to any open mic night. Realize that most all of your the best stand up comics you can think of, Dave Chappelle, um, Andrew Dice Clay, any of these super super famous comics, Dennis Leary, they all sucked at one time. They were learning, they, and you know, you know what I'm saying. That that people are so afraid of failure that they don't even try. I'm like, you have zero chance of success if you don't get out there and fail. And failure's good for you. You grow from it. That you you go, you know, okay, well that that looked like crap, or this this didn't work, or that joke wasn't funny, or or whatever. And you just go, but what can I learn from that? Is you you have to. It hurts. It it does. I know that. But what hurts worse is not expressing whatever it is, whatever your creative thing is, not allowing that to be expressed. I think it is harmful to you if you have that. Not a, and I I honestly believe everyone has some form of creativity in them. It may not be. It may never ever really manifest itself much. Or it may not be in anything that you would really call creative or, or, or that, that is in any kind of a marketable demand or whatever. But I think it's really unhealthy for you if you don't express it because I think it will manifest. It's a need we have. I mean, you look all the way back to cave paintings and stuff like that. People, it's a way of saying I was here. This, this is my effect on the world. This is my legacy. I think to me, that's one of the coolest things about what I do is I imagine a hundred years from now, something I made is going to be sitting in a corner covered in dust and someone's going to go, man, you know, where did that come from? Well, grandpa bought it from this idiot in Wyoming a hundred years ago and we just never got rid of it. The cat likes it. So <laughs> we never got rid of it. You know, but whatever. It's the same way. I mean, you look, we're we're still listening to songs that were written three, four, five hundred years ago. We're looking at paintings. You know, we're reading stories that are thousands of years old. Yep. I mean, that's a way, you know, there, there are philosophies that say if you're remembered, you'll live forever. Mm -hmm. that how many people don't know who Leonardo da Vinci was? You know, how many, you, you, you don't have to, you wouldn't have to ask very many people for them to name you a famous artist, a famous painter whose paintings are still there, their works are still there. Yeah. And I think we shortchange the world by not encouraging artists to be artists. Yeah. That you never, you never know. You know, yeah. what was Da Vinci like when he was a kid? You know, how, who knew he was going to be one of the greatest geniuses of his time? Yeah. That, but he was able, because of the Renaissance, he was able to flourish. And being able to do that is, in, don't let fear ruin what you could do. And I, that's, I worry about that. Think about that you have no idea what sort of geniuses right now may not exist simply because they weren't in the right environment. They didn't have the right thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Who's, who's the doctor that's sitting on the cure to cancer? But yeah. And seek the doctorate who's the uh painter that that could be could make that piece of art that inspires all countries to solve uh, global warming or or whatever right because it's those the song that stops a war yeah yeah those sort of things have happened from great magnificent pieces of art and it's not mm -hmm. always the piece of art that you know a hundred years down the line somebody goes and looks at and goes Wow, that's that's amazing. It's not always that work of art. It's the work of art that somebody at the time was like, just felt something and it moved them to do something great and different. And yeah, that's that's so much of what inspires creative types. Yeah, you want to change the world. Everybody sets out with grand ambitions when they're young to change the world. Everybody wants to be that person that's like, Maybe you don't want to be the president, but you want to be the person that inspired the president or the person that was, you know, there at the right moment that had the right words or had the right motivations. That's that's the person that history remembers, because, you know, you can look back through history and you can see all these great ambitious leaders and people like that. But at some point, sometime along the line, somebody inspired them in some way. Right. Before yeah. The point. And, and I think something 
that that really bothers me. I had a friend of mine. He uh, built custom vehicles. He built custom off-road vehicles. He built hot rods and stuff. And he did all sorts of crazy stuff. And he always did it his way. He used vehicles that he hot rodded vehicles that nobody else would. He did just crazy one-off things that he liked. And one of the stories he told about was um, how the old guys would look at what he was doing and just crap all over it because I said, well, that's stupid. And he said he made it a point, and I do it too. There are plenty of things that I see that are not my taste, whether it's in custom motorcycles or or custom bows or woodworking or whatever, the things that I'm interested in, and I have my particular styles that I like. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it doesn't have merit. And it's wrong for us to sit there and become all tribal and say, oh, well, you're a science fiction writer. You're a comedy writer. We have to hate each other. And I'm going to crap all over your stuff because it's not comedy. Or I'm going to crap all over your stuff because it's not it's not science fiction or whatever. When in reality, we need to say, man, I recognize the work you put in this. It's not for me. You know, it's the same way with music. You st it's still something that was created. It's a piece of you. And when you're crapping on someone oh, that's produced something like that, you're literally telling them they don't have merit. You're, I'm telling you that you're lesser because you made something that I don't like. And that is just wrong. And you see it a lot. Like I said, people get opinionated. They get into these camps and they say, okay, I, if it isn't this, then it's crap. And that's wrong. And like that's why I like about with the fable is you guys are trying to say everybody here has merit. What you are doing is art. You are an artist. Own it. Just because I doesn't I don't like it doesn't make you less of an artist or less or make it less valuable. Oh, I've I've definitely featured a couple of works that I was like, you know what? I don't like that. It it, it disturbs me. It doesn't make me feel good. But that's not what it's about. It's about getting pe that person that loves that 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 would gravitate towards that piece i've I've definitely had those um and it's it's kind of hard sometimes to be like well, i really hate that and you don't i don't tell i don't tell the people that at all and i never would even if i met them face to face and they were like what do you think of this i would still find something to say about it because even though I don't like it, and that's probably how I would say it, because you know me, I'm I'm gonna tell you one way or another how that is. Um, it, it's even if I don't like it, I will still be like, your use of black is really good. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. In there, <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I think that that yeah that you want to be honest about it, but again, you know who no one appoints me as lord and and you know it grand inquisitor of what cool is or what you know just because like i said i'm i'm an old fart man there are things that i like that other people don't there's things that are fashionable that i don't find fashionable that doesn't mean they're not cool they're just they're not for me and, yeah. and it, it's hard when like i said when you see someone that doesn't like your stuff to realize that okay well you don't like my stuff. It's not that my stuff is bad. It's just, it's not for you. And you can't let you, it's discouraging. And it's one of those things you have to overcome. And I'm sure it happens. It crosses all, all forms, forms of art, all, all, all boundaries. It's not, it, it's a common thing. You know, I mean, I can't imagine the first guys doing rap music and nobody liked it. You know, now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Oh yeah. All right. You want to wrap this up with a quick lightning yeah, round? Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, go ahead. We're at almost an hour here of talking about your woo-woo, so that, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, but you'll edit it down. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm not big on editing. <laughs> but, all right. So here we go. We're going to go into the lightning round. All right. What's your favorite food? Quick as you can. Come on. Favorite food? Fried chicken. <laughs> What's that? Don't say Taco John's. <laughs> no, fried chicken. Fried chicken. Okay. What's your least favorite food? Carrots. Carrots. Okay. Okay. Favorite color? Black. Black. Okay. Least favorite color? White. White. Oh, 
contrasts here going on. Okay. Favorite thing to wear on a cold day? Um, warm clothes. Uh, my uh, probably a hoodie. Yeah. Okay. You don't have a favorite hoodie or something? No, I don't think so. Normally, I wear like these. I wear I I wear these cheap. I bought them. Used bought them years ago at Walmart. Um, these grizzly fleece long john tops and usually a flannel shirt. I guess if favorite thing to wear would probably be a flannel shirt. I there have you. insulated flannel shirts. Oh, there you go. Okay. So what is something that you have always wanted? Um, like a thing? Yeah. Something like an item that you've always wanted. Yeah. Some item or something that you've always wanted. I can't think of anything like material wise anymore. Um, oh, I guess I can actually a Honda mini trail 70 CC mini bike because they had those when I was, I used to live in Daytona beach when I was a kid and they used to rent them to tourists and I was always super jealous. Okay. And every time I see one, it makes me think about that. They would bring semi trailers full of them down onto the beach and rent them to tourists. And we never, we were so poor. We never had money to rent them. And I always wanted one. So a <laughs> Honda mini trail mini bike. Okay. 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 What's the fa your favorite thing that you own now? My favorite thing that I own my motorcycle. Yeah, I was gonna say this. I thought that was gonna be the easy one. Okay, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? That's easy. I would want Rogue's power. I would want to be able to steal anybody else's superpowers and use them for a while until I get bored of them. That's a cop out. Come on. <laughs> it is not. That's the best one. That's absolutely the best one because I get to have them all and I can take them from you and you can't do anything about it. And then I can also teach you humility because you're not super powerful anymore. You're crap. You're just a normal person again. And I can say, see, you forgot what this is like. You've had laser beam eyes since you were 14 years old. Now you're like everybody else. But that, that also you know, comes think, to honestly, I would other people have been given this opportunity and you're not the only person with superpowers because that would be the real bummer. You get the power to steal their powers and nobody else. <laughs> and there are none. That would be my luck too. There are none. Like if I was the only if I was the only one, oh, I would probably want the ability to breathe underwater and survive like this like Aquaman, because two thirds of our planet is is water and we know more about the surface of the moon than we do the bottom of the ocean. Just think you'd be the first person to see so much stuff. And yeah. who knows what's down there. Yeah. Maybe I go down there and I get super rich from taking stuff out of shipwrecks. <laughs> I, can, I could even make money at it. Yeah, you'd have because superheroes are always so poor. <laughs> no, overhead. you don't. You'd have an exclusive market there. You would have no overhead because you could just dive down, get your stuff, and then yes. come back. <laughs> exactly, that'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, so I want to thank you, Dan, for uh, joining and uh, talking. You, you got the first interview here on this. I appreciate you doing that.